gonna break some vinyl down from the front to the back with bags on tracks. Welcome to Breaking Vinyl. I'm your host, Dez, aka Johnny Fever. And as always, I'm joined by my two co hosts. First up, the podcaster coming through in high fidelity, Evil Ed. What's up, Ed? What up, Dez? How you doing? Good. And last but not least, the podcaster playing the deep cuts, Beside Dave. What's up, Dave? Hello, how's it going? All right. Tonight, we will be discussing Jane's Addictions, Nothing Shocking. Nothing Shocking is the debut studio album by American rock band Jane's Addiction, released on August 23rd, 1988 through Warner Brothers Records. Nothing Shocking was well-received by critics and peaked at number 103 on the Billboard 200. The band's original lineup featured the freak Perry Farrell on vocals, Dave Navarro on guitar, Eric Avery on bass, and Stephen Perkins on drums. And I got a couple of fun facts on this one, guys. Perry Farrell created the sculptures and shot the photography for the album art on this one. And the band was dubbed Jane's Addiction in honor of Farrell's housemate, Jane Bainter, who was their muse and inspiration. So there you go. That's the setup for the album. <laughs> oh, when do we get to the dick parts? Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> because we all know how Farrell was. <laughs> and uh, oh yeah, absolutely. He uh, he wanted to control all the money. He wanted everything. Um, and it's funny because a lot of this album, um, you know, people say that a lot of it was influenced by his girlfriend at the time. You know, she kind of helped come up with the concept and. You know, you'll notice that albums after this one never sounded like this one. And it's because basically him and the band were just saying to her, like, you're not part of the band. And she was like, well, then you know what? I'm take all my great fucking ideas and go fucking take my ball and go play somewhere else. And you can hear it on the next album. It's just not there. Let's just get some quick opening thoughts. I'll start this off and then we will uh, break this album down. Did you guys catch the Johnny Fever? I mean, come on. I love the Johnny Fever. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Love WKRP in Cincinnati. Who doesn't? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I will start us off. This album for me really kind of capsulizes like a very important year of my life. So it was 1988. Um, I got an opportunity to go out to California and, and chase my what would eventually be a failed career at being a rock star. Um We've all been there, Des. Yeah, oh, yeah. so I, I went out to San Francisco. I slept next to a car in a garage for a couple of weeks until I finally was able to get a job on Hate Street. Hate Nashbury I was working in a cool rock and roll clothing store called Daljeet's. And I ended up getting an apartment down on 6th and Mission, like the worst possible area you could live in. And I met a beautiful girl. You know, we fell in love. <laughs> this is like an age old story, right? <laughs> um, after the earthquake, we ended up moving out to Greenwich Village in New York, um, you know, scrap our whole nine yards, and then eventually ended up back in Boston, my hometown, where she ripped my heart out of my ass. So we listened to this album a lot um, on our travels and our adventures. And then when she left me, of course, I leaned on this album and just used it to just pour alcohol on the wounds of my broken heart. So this one holds a special place in my heart. And that's pretty much my memory of nothing shocking. And let's have you ever listened to this front to back before pre preparing for this uh, podcast? I have not. Uh, okay. I am not a huge Jane addictions fan. Okay. Jane's addiction. Um, obviously I know the mountain song Jane says in been caught stealing. Um, but yeah, this this album, uh, it's uh, there were ups, there were downs, and then there was me wanting to jump out the window. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll get to it when we get to the tracks. Right. So, <laughs> but overall, you don't have a lot of history with this album. No, I have next. I've never heard this album. A lot of these songs, yeah, okay. other than the Mountain Song and Jane says that's it on this. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, again, like I said, this, this one was the soundtrack to a lot of my life. I love this one. <laughs> and Dave, have you listened to this album front to back before preparing for the podcast? I heard it one time. No uh, fucking way. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, had, I had no history with it in the 80s. Holy um, shit. At, at the time, I was, you know, completely, you know, your uh, Kiss, Van Halen, Poison, Bon Jovi kind of guy. Um, you know, Jane's Addiction was not on the radar except for, you know, the radio songs. You know, Jane says Mountain Song yeah. had a dad. Uh, uh, but yeah, not too long ago, um, my girlfriend now, uh, it's actually one of her favorite albums and yes. we were on a uh, road trip and she said, okay, you, you're going to check this out. We're going to listen to this. And I said, okay. <laughs> and we, we checked it out and, uh, went through it. And that was the one time I heard it in its entirety before, uh, listening to it for this podcast. All right. Well, don't give us your thoughts. Don't give it away. But Dave, I would have guessed that you would be very familiar with this album. So that surprises me. So that's that's pretty cool. And I think that's going to surprise some of our listeners that know you as well. I think that that's <laughs> going to be a shock. I think that's going to be shocking. No pun intended. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into this thing. Uh, the first cut on the album is Up the Beach. And uh, Ed, why don't you take us? What'd you think of this? Uh, you know what? I really, when I put it on, it's a great opener for an album, in my opinion. Uh, very cool in, intro, powerful, big sound, full sound. Uh, however, once it, it it got there, it never went anywhere else. This one song. It was like, oh, gee. like I was excited. I'm like, all right, well, it it definitely allowed me to to get dragged in and want more um to see what's coming next yes i this I actually don't... really hearing this i was like okay I, i'm super as a bass player i'm super excited to hear the bass throughout this album i'm, I'm glad you said that because this is a theme that's going to come up a lot during this podcast is this album is written around great bass lines that yeah. are going to start songs off and they're going to write around it and it's the unsung hero of this album in my opinion um, I agree fully. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. So, yep. And and the drums as well too. I mean, this yep. drummer is playing extremely unorthodox beats that you're not hearing in 1988. I mean, you're getting a lot of straight, um, you know, Mick Brown, uh, just crashing drums that are right on the beat, you know. Yeah. And this guy is really doing something very different, and it gives this album a very unique sound. Um, up the beach for me. I usually don't like a slow cut with no lyrics as an opening track to an album, but I am going to make an exception in this case because Ed, like you, I feel like it sets the mood for the rest of this album. Um, at three minutes, if a it's going to have long. no, I, it is because at three minutes, I feel like if if it's going to be just like an intro saison to get an album going, give me like maybe a minute and a half, two minutes of this, and I'm fine. Um, you know. Perry Farrell's using his voice almost as an instrument in this, mm -hmm. which I really, I really thought was cool. I hadn't heard anything like it at this point. Um, Dave Navarro was playing this like descending scale that is like really catchy. That -doo 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 -doo. I just thought that was amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. His, it, I was never a huge fan of Navarro, but hearing that, I was like, okay. Yeah, he, this took me by surprise. I wasn't expecting some of what he played on that. Yeah, he is a he's a really good guitar player. And what's weird about this is, and you know, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on this again throughout this podcast, but it almost sounds like he's like improving, jamming through a lot of this album, and it almost sounds like a lot of the band is doing that because in a lot of songs you'll get a bridge like back hit back then they're using analog, so there's no cut and paste digital here, right? But mm -hmm. With a lot of bands at the time, like you listen to the bridge and it's the same bridge. You could almost cut and paste it every time into spot and chorus. But with this band, every section of the song is played a little differently because they're jamming. So, uh, Dave, what did you think of Up the Beach? Uh, yeah, I mean, that the moody bass line that it starts with is cool. Uh, I, I felt like it kind of rambled a little bit. Uh, yes. You know, that that went along with what you guys said about it running long. You know, you're not really sure where they're going with with what they're doing there. Um, I, I didn't think it was a great opening to the album. Okay. 
Okay. Um, you know, I, I'm going to agree with that. I feel like I would have rather had this one. Like, how about this? How about, um, how about that song they, up the they beach? They started side two of the record with it. Maybe. Yeah. Or, or even you make that the last, uh, 35 seconds of the ocean size. There yeah. You, go. you know what I mean? So, but, but again, I'm fine with it. I mean, they were trying to do something different in 1988 where a lot of like, you know, glam metal was, you know, really hitting and they succeeded. I mean, it, it was different. So I'll, I'll oh, yeah. credit them for that. Um, do you guys have anything else on that track? No, no, no. it was really, it. it's like I, like I said earlier, just, it didn't go anywhere. Well, it did. It went into ocean size, which we're going to do next. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll take this one. So, um, a fact on this song is Perry Farrell wrote this song about being homeless in LA at the time when he was, you know, like up and coming and crashing in a flop house with 14 other people in LA. So I thought that was pretty cool. And, you know, what I really love about this album and about Perry Farrell in general is the guy really r writes his lyrics from life experience. And I can respect that because, you know, I mean, like you guys, I've played in tons of bands and I am a songwriter and, uh, you know, I like to write from experience and I've, I've actually played with guys that like, they go to write a song and they'll pull out like their three favorite albums and like spread out the lyrics in front of them and start Ugh. just like creating a song from somebody else's experiences and ideas. And it's nope. like, yeah, it's, it, and you know what? It always stinks on a song. I can smell it every time. Um, so this song for me is amazing. I mean, from the content of the lyrics to the dynamics between the sections of music, you know, going from like really affected to not so affected, really fast, really slow, different types of like beats. Um, Navarro's guitar playing is loose again. It's almost like he's jamming, but it's very melodic and memorable. And the bass and drums are just locked in on this one, delivering like a powerful and memorable beat bass line. Um, and this song right here ranks as one of my favorite songs of all times. I just, I gush over this song. I fucking love it. Uh, Wait, of all time? Yeah, I'm. This is one of my all-time favorite songs. There's three wow. on this. Yeah, there's three on this album that rank with my on my all-time list, and this is one all of time my, of all every time. song ever written. Yeah, three of is, them are on this album. Well, let's say. Well, <laughs> let's say when I'm saying all time, like let's say there's, you know, fifty songs on that list. Three okay. of them, three of them come off this album. All right, no, that, that's fine. Yeah, and again, this also goes back to Ed. Like, this is one of those albums for me. Like, I'm sure there's probably a Bon Jovi album that is in your heart that brings you back to moments of your life. You know what I mean? And oh no, I get it. The whole yeah, yeah, yeah. If it so, has personal meaning to you. I get he, that. But, very yeah. nostalgic. Very nostalgic. Yes. Yep. Um, yep. Dave, what do you think of uh, Ocean Size? I, I feel like it would have been a better opening track for the album. Agreed. Um, you know, with the acoustic intro, and then they just sort of slam into the you know rocking part of it. Uh, there's a lot of atmospheric stuff going on there. Oh yeah. Um, you know, the shredding guitar solo was great, but oh, still... wasn't it when it when it like stops and then just breaks into that solo? That's very powerful, very dramatic, very dynamic. Oh, yeah. I loved it. But yeah, I mean, it, it was still tasteful, you know, and not not way too over the top, but it was yes. still you know, pretty, uh, pretty powerful. Yeah. yeah. And as fast as he's playing throughout this album, cause he does play a lot of really quick licks and he's using a lot of whammy bar, obviously. And the, the guitar is almost over affected, but it works for this album. I wish they had kind of backed it off here and there a little bit, but, um, you can really make out most of the notes he's playing and it's very melodic and it doesn't get, uh, it doesn't get lost in the speed and the effects. Would you agree? Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't get too messy with anything, yeah. but, uh, you know, pretty, I would imagine he used a pretty simple setup, you know, oh, I, yeah. I've never heard, you know, but you know, maybe an amp with a couple pedals or something like that, you know, a couple of hundred pedals. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ed, what are your thoughts on ocean size? Uh, love the bass groove. Great right? bass groove in the song. Uh, you know, Navarro's guitar is really good. This one thing, though, like I, I listen to the song, and this is first two songs. I'm like, all right, I'm, I was really getting excited for this album, but it 
two minutes, six seconds in the song, there is a bass note that I can't tell if it's a mistake that they didn't pull out really? because it just sounds so bad. I, I heard that and he does it again later. <laughs> yeah. Really? And I'm later, like, later in the song. And it, yeah, it, it it's sounds so bad. weird. It's uh, yeah. It's I'm like, it wrecked it for me. <laughs> oh, sh- okay. So I'm writing this down. You said it's a two Oh six. 206. Okay, so I am going to go back and listen to this after the podcast. And um, if any listeners want to do the same and then comment on it, uh, let us know if you think it was a mistake or if it was done intentionally. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, I'm it. sure it was done intentionally, but it it just it sounds like a mistake. It's it's just not it's a good just, idea. It doesn't fit. Bad choice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like it's it's a terrible lead in note. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like 204, 206. You can't miss it. And once you hear it, you can't unhear it, so be careful, Des. Okay, I might not listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if you guys got nothing else, we'll move on to how to dab. Um, Dave. All right, so what do you think of this guy? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember hearing it, you know, on the radio or wherever. Um, you know, tight riff, good guitar playing. Um you know, the, the whole story, apparently, backstory was uh, the bass player, you know, had the idea about his, uh, you know, about his, his family situation. And, yeah. you know, they sort of took it from there and developed the song. But uh, it's all right. You know? Yeah. He found out that his uh, that he had a, a different biological father and he didn't know. He thought his dad was his dad. And then he found out later that it was actually a different dude. So that's what the song was. um was written about uh anything else on that one dave uh not for me okay ed what do you think of how to dad uh again bass german song you can tell this was this whole album is really just bass centered which yeah. i loved however this is when perry farrell's just overall sound of the same just started getting to me <laughs> he, i just think he needs to, he needs to lay off all the reverb and all the effects and just sing. Yeah. Um, you know, and it just, it's creative, it's different, but I just got, this is where I just started to get tired of the effects. And I couldn't agree with you more. And as much as I love Perry Farrell <laughs> and I love what he was doing on this album, cause it was different. I mean, he was <laughs> using his voice like an instrument a it, lot. Yeah. And I get you it. Know, yeah. Almost like horns or a keyboard <laughs> section. They were just doing it with his voice, and it was great. But like Dave Navarro, I wish on some of these tracks they had backed that all the way off and made me want it more. You know, like yes. made me miss it for a track or two. Yep. And uh, this would have been a perfect song to do that on. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's a fun little jam. It's fine. It has some nice changes in it, like um, you know, that one stop where it stops, then it goes into. If you see my dad, tell him, you know, that part, that's really, that's a really nice part. Um, some beautiful vocals. It's got some uh, really good guitar licks and like little runs in it. But I don't know. This song for me is almost feels a little bit like a filler on the album. Would you guys agree? Oh, Maybe. I don't even, it's a filler, but we're getting into the meat of me getting angry. Oh god, no! We're coming up to we're we're coming up to one of the best songs on the album. Oh, um, anger meter is rising. <laughs> oh shit! Do you guys got anything more on uh, on <laughs> Adam? I don't no. even want to ask. Okay, all right. So uh, from that little ditty, we're going to go into Ted. Just admit it. Um, I wish right off the bat, I wish they had called this song "Nothing Shocking," and you know, I, I get it. The song is written about the Ted Bundy murders, and that is actually Ted Bundy speaking in the beginning. Um, and I get it. It's it's clever, but I think it would have been more clever had they just called it nothing shocking and let people figure out it was about Ted Bundy. Now, you got to remember back in 1988, there was no Internet. So, you know, maybe Perry thought that it, that wouldn't get out, whereas today, you know, it's, you know, everybody could just find it by clicking on your keypad. But um, I wish they had titled it that. Um, so on this one, Perry Farrell's lyrics are just haunting. The the writing, the delivery of the vocal, I just, I think it's really, really good. 
Um, the drums and bass steal the show on this one. There's some really, really good drumming on this track. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I got on it. But that's, again, I think the drums and the bass are the unsung heroes of this album. Oh, These the whole album. Are, yeah, they're playing great together. And they're kind of really not even playing together so much and definitely not playing with Perry Farrell and Dave Navarro, which gives this album a very unique sound. Um, Dave, what do you think of uh, Ted just a minute? Um, you know, I, I listened to the drum intro with all the, the echo on it and, you know, kind of reminded me of almost reggae a little bit. Yes. Um, oh, when yeah. you're first coming into that, um, you know, Perry's doing like a mouth trumpet thing. And yeah, no, that, totally. That kind of amusing, you know, with the atmospheric, uh, you know, everything going on. You know, the song takes a few left turns. Um, you know, I know the uh, the song was in Natural Born Killers. They used that yes. during a certain uh, scene of the uh, of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny you, you brought up the reggae feel because we're going to get that again in Jane Sends where they go to the steel drum. Yeah. Um, and I did think that there were some really cool other genres of music that were kind of slipped in under the radar here. Like there's some like grooves that Dave Navarro plays that are kind of jazzy and kind of bluesy. And you don't really notice it because the guitar is really hot and affected. And, you know, you're getting these, again, this bass and this drum track that is just, you know, doing something else. So it kind of draws your attention away, but it's there if you're looking for it. Um, and what'd you think of, uh, let's call it nothing shocking. Well, this is where the uh, PG goes right out the window. This is where I wanted to fucking start smashing my head against the wall. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Honestly, I thought the song was garbage. Oh. I, I thought it was boring and bland. Uh, the, the harmonies were a little cool where it kicks in at the end. But I it, it was a struggle for me to listen to this song. Like, oh. this made me hate this band. Oh, God, ah. I can't believe it. I fucking love this song. Holy shit. Oh, I think it is total trash. Oh God. It's like what it it literally to me, it seems like someone put a microphone in front of a speaker and said, let's see how we can manipulate feedback. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I respect your opinion. That's why you're on the show. It's great, you know, and that's what makes this fun. Is, and I, you know, I, I like like I have nothing against anyone in the band. Like I said, I, the the bass and drums killed it on this album, in my opinion. Uh, Navarro and and Farrell are great at what they do. I just this by this point of the album, I just couldn't deal with Perry Farrell anymore. Ed, it's the I same it. same effect, same sound, same everything. It oh, no. it's only song number four. I know. I, oh, I, wait till you hear the rest of my notes for the other songs. Oh, shit. So, so guys, I love this because here's the thing, okay? If we all heard the album and we all loved it, this show wouldn't be fun. Right. So oh, this know. is, you know, this is like we're, I, and it's funny because, you know, this is what life is. It's perception. You know, it's how you perceive yeah. things. Everyone and has an clearly, opinion. Clearly, yep. we perceive this one differently. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. So the next song is Standing in the Shower Thinking. And Ed, I might be with you on this one. So go ahead. Take it away, Ed. Uh, my first note, Kill Me Now. Okay. <laughs> that definitely wasn't my first note, but go ahead. My second note, I don't fucking care about his shower. <laughs> like, I get it. It, it. It's almost like he was like, well, what should I write a song about? Uh, I took a shower this morning. Let me describe that. And it's like, what the fuck? Ed, I like your I, take. I, yeah. Oh, terrible. I like your take because you know what? <laughs> I think that is the origin of this shower. He was like, fuck, we need two more songs. Right, right yeah. in the shower. <laughs> um, Dave, what do you think of standing in the shower thinking? Uh, it was a real, like, kind of happy sound and, and yeah. these weird stream of consciousness lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that it kind of bothered me, too. Um, you know, these guys aren't singing about fast cars and whiskey and, and no. you know, going going down to the nudie bar or something like that. It, you know, that's what I'm used to. 
and 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 that's not what we're getting here at all. But uh, <laughs> Dave, it's a- so funny, true, Dave. <laughs> Dave, it's funny you actually said that because I wrote in my notes um, that I loved the. Uh, lyrical writing on this album because at the time what we were getting was bands writing about switchblades, strip joints, lipstick, Jack Daniels, and Harley Davisons. And yeah, I yeah. like that this went away from that. Um, but but with I that agree. being yeah. said, yeah. definitely this different. song, my notes basically just say this song felt like a total afterthought. It, it's fine. It did not fit on the album. They should not have put it on the album. And it's gonna ding the score for me at the end for sure. This sucked. And when I say it sucked, I mean, it just sucked in context of the rest of this album. It didn't belong. Um, Question. I want you to guys answer. Honestly, do you pee when you're alone in the shower? (laughs) I would be lying. I would be lying if I said I haven't. (laughs) Okay. And Dave. hundred percent. Yes. Okay. And I pissed on my feet as well. So there we go. Um, (laughs) Great guitar solo from that song too, by the way. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, totally. I mean, again, it's 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 fine. It's just not. I mean, we all agree it sucked. Um, so the next one that comes up is uh, Summertime Rolls. This is a very, very long track. Dave, take it away. <laughs> Oh yeah, the uh, the bass intro and synth strings, and uh, you know, I kind of looked into it a little bit, and and the critics at the time were making these, you know, Led Zeppelin comparisons, you know, to these yeah. guys, and you know, oh, this is next Led Zeppelin, and you know, I kind of hear that from this track, um, you know, that, that kind of gives you that that sort of reminder, um, but you know, what what is he singing about? I have, right. I have no idea. You know, I'm listening to the lyrics and it's just, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, pot smoking music, whatever. I think this one's supposed <laughs> to just be, you know, just listen to it, take it for what it is. And this is where I actually wrote that note though. Um, so I keep going back to this, but these songs are built around great bass riffs and this one's no different. Again, we're going to get this great bass riff with these really kind of like, you know, moody drums. And this is where I said, you know, Perry Farrell's lyrics are original, especially for 1988, when a lot of bands were pumping out cheesy lyrics in my case. And and I'm not poo-pooing that because as Ed knows, you know, uh, I put on plenty of lipstick. I had purple and green hair and got behind plenty of cheesy fucking lyrics. Trust me. But when I heard this, I felt like I was listening to something different. Um, and you know, the drums again, that unorthodox drumming just gives this song a very original feel. Um, Ed, what'd you think? Ed? Yeah, Mike's out. All right. I'm going to speak for Ed. Ed loved this song. He, (laughs) he texted me and he told me that this is now one of his favorite songs of all times. Ever. Yeah, yeah. Since Okay, I, Ed's back. Now we can tell you what he really thought of summertime rolls. Yeah, since since I had my mute. <laughs> uh this is the last of the uh jerk the wheel into a pole song for oh, me God. on this album. Uh Stop. I feel it goes nowhere, but I honestly when you said it's pot smoking music, you're you're dead on. It's almost like they they have this bad pink floyd vibe oh this song <laughs> <laughs> it's just it just it's too like all right dude i want to get up off the couch and no long i want to like move have my heart get above you know 14 beats a minute like oh, i was close i was honestly close to death <laughs> <laughs> I thought you guys were gonna fucking love this album. <laughs> oh shit! Oh no, I thought yeah, I was it just this. this song did. Uh, these three songs, the last three songs, were just they. I they're just not my thing. They're I too gotcha. too trippy, too mellow. It, I felt like it was a jam band, and I can't stand jam bands. It and Same. you know what. You're a hundred percent right, and this is a jam band. I mean, let's be honest. Jane's Addiction is a jam band, a jam band, but yeah. I feel like they do it right. But it it on a eleven song listen, especially when they're not 
throwing us curveballs, like you said, with the effect on Perry's voice. Yeah, it, yeah it's all the same song, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah, and it's a shame because they were really on to something here where they were... Um, they I were, agree. They were breaking ground and they were like, you know, doing things differently. The only problem was they needed to go back to just some standard like blues based rock and roll. And I mean, you know, David Navarro can play it and Perry yep. can sing it. And obviously the bass player and the drummer are. The problem was I felt like maybe the producer got a little excited with this new toy he was playing with. Yes. You and, know what? That's a great analogy. It is. It's like the producer said, hey, check this out and wouldn't stop playing with it. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I just wish, like you said, I wish they had they had just made us miss this and sprinkled it in on a couple of the songs that it really worked on and then backed it off on the ones that it didn't need it on and it would have been way more effective, 100%. Yeah. Um, next song is the Mountain Song. This one, it, it creeps even closer to my favorite songs of all times. Like this one is getting closer towards the front end of that list, okay? Um this song was written about Perry Farrell's mother's suicide. So this is a deep song. Uh, we have, per you know, again, Perry Farrell, he's writing about real experiences, which I feel is essential, um, especially when you're writing a song like this. This isn't something you can fake. And that's what makes this song so powerful and makes his vocal feel so genuine because he is definitely singing from the gut on this one. Um what I do like about Perry Farrell on this album is I don't feel like he's ever running out of um, range. Like I listen to some albums, especially from the late eighties where, you know, guys were like, you know, like I don't want to poo poo a guy like Brett Michaels, but let's just use them in this instance. You know, Oh, you look great, man. Yeah. You're the singer of the band, you know, it's like, but can you sing? <laughs> Doesn't matter. You know, it's like, okay. So Perry has no, limit of range he is getting on top of this music getting on top of these tracks and uh and it's effective and i really i really enjoy it um this is hands down the best bass line on the album comment it's fucking great it's hypnotic totally it is. hypnotic yeah so yeah this one for me is probably Again, this this is probably my favorite song on the album, not to give it away, but it's it's a tie between this and another, and I'll I'll give it to you at the end. Um, Dave, what do you think of the mountain song? Um, uh, yeah, it's it's you know, kind of the big song that everybody's heard. You heard it everywhere. You know, anybody who plays bass, uh, that's you know, one of the first songs they've learned. Um uh, it's kind of the most like a normal you know, quote unquote rock song that, uh, yes. you know, they're, they're doing on here. Um, they're, uh, you can kind of see that the band was, was capable of doing, you know, just your, your average dopey rock song that, you know, could sell a million or whatever, but they, they just didn't want to be satisfied with that. So, you yes. know, they sort of just took, took that turn and, and, you know, went for something different and, uh, they sure succeeded, you know, getting something different. Definitely, <laughs> you know, no. Obviously it's, it's, you know, they have their audience and, and everything like that and the success that they did have, uh, you know, and if, if they just went straight, you know, they, they may not have had that kind of a success you know, deal. Yeah. 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 It's an, it's a niche, it's a niche group, but it was a big niche group. I mean, they definitely carved out a, uh, a place for themselves, kind of like Alice in Chains and bands like that. Now, it's funny you said that, Dave, because I wish that they had taken three songs off of this album. I wish they had taken off Thank You Boys, um, Standing in the Shower, and even the next song, Idiot's Rule, which we'll get to. And I wish they had written three songs that were maybe a little more mainstream, a little less effect, maybe some big choruses, uh, and and just close the album out strong, you know? So, uh, Ed, <laughs> the mountain song. Talk to me. Uh, Give me some good news here. I love this song. This is, okay, this, yes. I'm with you, Des. This is one of my favorite songs. Oh, good. Uh, just great energy, great sound. Um, you know, it, it's got a flow to it that you doesn't matter what type of music you like, you're going to enjoy this song. And okay. that's what I really like about it. Yeah. Um, but funny that you know the the three songs you want to take off are 
probably three of my favorite songs on oh, no. this. <laughs> and I would have taken off the three that I just destroyed. And I agree with you. They should have written something a little more. I wouldn't consider this mainstream, but for them, I guess it's mainstream. Yeah. For the time. Yes. Um, you know, because it, it was great to have something with a lot of balls behind it. And that's what this song gives it attitude. It gives the album attitude, I think. 100%, dude. You know, this song, um, this song for me, it seems like they did back off the effect a little bit. Would you guys agree? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's produced more like a rock song. Yep. Um and I feel like a couple of other songs this album would have been better if they had been produced like this. So I'm going to put a little of the blame on the producer. And um, yeah, I feel like I feel like they could have written a couple more of these. And I yes. think they were more than capable of doing it. Oh yeah. And and yeah. you know this album could have been fucking. It could have fucked. This thing could have been a fucking. Could have slapped hard. But oh yeah. If, if yeah. they even had one more of these on this album, I think this album would have been, you know, like their appetite for destruction. I think they do. I think they do. And we'll get to it. Um, I don't want to give it away because we're going to do it, but appetite for destruction, though it's been overplayed and there's songs I just can't listen to anymore. For instance, sweet child of mine. I, if it comes on the fucking radio, I'm like breaking my finger, trying to like shut it off. Yeah. Cause I, as amazing as it is. And it is fucking one of the best songs of all times. It's a guitar solo, the hook. Oh. It's, it's, it's magic. But, right, but back to this song. Stay, I can't stay off. It. All right. So, yeah. So, anyway. <laughs> we'll kiss. That, that's one. Uh, one more, too. What about Velvet Revolver? Um, squirrel. 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 Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Contraband's coming up, boys. Uh, um, all right. So, Mountain Song, we pretty much did it. It's it's a fucking badass song across the board. Uh, Idiot's Rule. Ed, take it away. Uh, I like this song. You Actually, I, I, yeah, I think it's got a cool, funky groove to it. Uh, I love that Flea's playing trumpet in it. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yeah. I um, love that. You know, and I, I actually think uh, Perry Farrell shows some range in it. There's some notes up there that I'm like, oh, there it is. Why wouldn't he showcase it? It yeah. seems like he's got a really big range and a good voice. Pull back on the effects, man. Uh, but it was nice to hear. Uh, I think the music is super full. Uh, like I said... Like mountain song into this, I was like, "All right, now we're getting a flow going." It, it's I'm starting to enjoy this. Uh, yeah, it, I, I really enjoyed the song, uh, and yeah. and it, it the the funk definitely added a little bit of a break to the previous songs. Absolutely, and I I know what I like that you said the funk because you know again there are some there are some undertones of different styles of music on this album if you're listening for it this one was obvious because they finally took some of the effect off the fucking track and you could actually hear what was going on yeah um, oh great yeah i agree dave what'd you think of idiot's role yeah it was real funky um you know the the vocal phrasing was very unique you know kind of not what you'd expect oh yeah you know, from, from, you know, normal pop or rock song, um, you know, he, he kind of plays with that, uh, a real lot throughout the album. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the, the guys from fishbone, you know, playing in that horn section with flea. So you cool. Know, yeah. It was, it was all right. But yeah, the, uh, a lot of different genres they're they're sort of, you know, putting in the stew. Yeah. yeah. The problem with this song is it's 40 seconds shorter than the intro with no words. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fucking problem. This song yeah, is three I agree. You, you need another 30 seconds of this song. It's three minutes long. Uh, yeah. You know, but yeah, it's fine. I mean, you know, you got the trumpets. It's great. You got the horns. It's great. Like you guys said, you know, Perry Farrell's bringing something a little different to this track. Uh, Dave Navarro's playing some really tasty licks in this one. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Really nice. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it it kind of doesn't fit the uh, the mood of the album, but I'm fine with it. It was a breath of fresh air when we got to it. Um, yeah, so of course, here we go next. Jane says, everybody's heard it. Dave, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, it's the big, the big radio song. Everybody knows, um, you know, very different subject matter from what we were getting in, in the late eighties of, of other songs, you know, we kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, you know, the steel drums that, you know, are not very common in a, in a rock song. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's like if if you were at a party in the 90s and there was a guy there with an acoustic guitar, you were definitely screaming this out loud, you know, drunk at the end of the night. (laughs) Definitely. Oh, yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's funny. You know, back in the day, Delyn said she would gauge when it was time to drag me home when I'd pick up an acoustic and play Every Rose Has a Thorn. As soon as I hit the first note, she'd be like, that's it. Let's go. We're out of here. (laughs) That was the gauge. She laughs about that to this day. Um, Yeah. So this song was actually written about the woman I had um, mentioned earlier, Jane Bainter. Uh, she, he wrote this about her and her boyfriend, Sergio, who actually, you know, named in the song and, you know, the abusive relationship they had. And she was a junkie and she would eventually, um, kick the drug addiction. Uh, the song is super iconic. You know, the steel drum gives it a totally original feel for me. Um, and it's different than the other ballads of the time, you know, I mean, most ballads of the time, you know, you had stuff like home sweet home and which again, a great song, but this is just different. And it stood apart from the other ballads that I had been hearing at the time. So I love this one. Ed, what'd you think? Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, you had all these power ballads and then, you know, they released this. And for me, it was like, whoa, this is like the piece de resistance for them. Yeah. You know, it is just, it's, I think it's really well written. The Calypso drums just add so much to this song, in my opinion. Totally agree. Um, you know, and the way they they marry the melody over the music, I think it's just it's like a perfect perfect marriage. Um, I really, this is one of those songs, like you said, it comes on. Uh, was it Dave? I think you said it. You know, everyone is singing it. You can't not. Oh, yeah. You know, you know. I think I, I played. Yeah. You know, I think I played this in in some band I was in for a short period of time, yeah. and I was like, whoa people are going crazy for this. <laughs> they love this song. Yeah. And, you know, in this one, Perry Farrell's storytelling ability is on full display. And Dave Navarro, he delivers a very iconic, but very recognizably simple guitar riff that just works. And it is kind of like some of the great ballads of all times, like every rose has its thorn, you know, I mean, sometimes the best ones are simple, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, this next track. Thank you, boys. Um, I have nothing to say. Fuck this. Fucking why is it even here? Fuck this fucking like thing. It's stupid. This, this was one of my most favorite songs on the album, actually. Me too. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely loved it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. Why? It's a minute. It's a minute of I don't get it. It doesn't yeah. fit on this album. It doesn't belong here. What does it mean? Oh yeah, they they don't really need it on on the album, but yeah, I, I saw an interview with Dave Navarro, and this mm-hmm. was actually like an inside joke um, for for their you know old timey fans that because they would play this live to be sort of a time filler in shows. Somebody broke a string, or they had to go you know take a whiz break or something like that. They would play that, and oh, that's cool. why they that's why they put it in the album. Oh, it's a fun fact. Yeah, that is a fun yeah. fact, yeah. But uh, and, I'm with you, Dave. I absolutely love this. Just it, it, it's it's a great little jazz swing tune that just you're listening. Then all of a sudden, you're like, "Wait, what?" Yeah. <laughs> Did he? But Did I he? wish the only thing I don't like is that, like, I wish it was longer and they kind of transitioned into something else. Like, because I think starting like that and then transitioning to what they are, I think would have been a great meld of music. Okay, so I'm 18 years old. My heart is broken. I'm drinking. I'm. I'm. Well, why did you leave me? Uh, you know, you know. What's this and, bullshit? Uh, and then this comes on. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is so. Anyway, whatever. It's fine. Jane's addiction can do no wrong on this album for me. It's just you know whatever. Um. So this final track, Pigs and Zen. Okay. This <laughs> and this is the third song on this album that's going to go on. My one of my favorite songs of all times. This fucking bass line and drum beat. Oh man, it hits hard. Um, the song was written about uh pigs being closer to Nirvana than human beings. Cause as Perry said, pigs fuck when they want to fuck, they eat when they want to eat, and they sleep when they want to sleep, and they don't worry about anything. So he said, you know what? Pigs and Zen. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um 
this is uh i think that the three songs that i mentioned on this are all pretty much masterpieces i think they're amazing uh you know again the tone is set by an unbelievably hot bass lick that's just you know weird, weird, so good and uh yeah i mean what else is there to say and perry fellows performance is amazing on this song um but it is the first time on this album when I feel like Perry Farrell did not meet the level of the song, the the music. I feel like the music of this song is just, oh, it's fucking good. It's good. And Perry kind of repeats himself a lot and came up a little short on the, uh, on the lyrics for me on this one. Um, Dave, what'd you think of Pigs and Zen? It, it was heavy, you know. The you get some like sort of funk metal going on there. The the phrasing and the music was a little straighter than a lot of their other songs. Um, but yeah, I sort of agree with you on the lyrics. I, I think it would be fun if we went through and counted how many times he says "pig" in the song. Too many times. <laughs> it's a Too lot. Many times. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a real lot. <laughs> yep, but it's all right. Um. Okay, Ed. Yeah, you know what? This th- when I heard the song, I was like, "All right, this is super cool," and this is what I was hoping the rest of the album would have been like. I dig the song, I dig the music. Um, Farrell's uh, Farrell's Farrell, but um, the music in this song is just fantastic. I really, really like it. Great drive. It's busy, but not. You sit there, you hear it, you're like, oh, it's kind of busy. But then you think about it and you're like, but it's not. Yeah. Um, you know, and I kind of dig that. So, yeah, I thought this was a hot track. Um, all right. So, uh, Dave, what was your favorite track on the album? I'm going to have to go with the mountain song. The mountain song. Yeah. Okay. Ed? Uh, same thing, but that's really because that's the second song I've ever heard from uh jane's addiction so okay um yeah okay if i pulled that out though i would probably say idiots rule okay Eh, fair (laughs) enough um yeah for me it's the mountain song too uh ocean size is a close second i mean they're kind of a and b for me or a and a i mean they're both great but yeah if i had to choose one it's mountain song and what track would you cut if you uh were to cut one i would cut thank you boys and if you guys were to Hold my feet to the fire and cut a full track. It would definitely be standing in the shower thinking because that's caca. <laughs> um, Ed, what album would you cut? I would cut three songs off this album. Oh shit! You only <laughs> choose one. You wow. only choose one. <laughs> if I could only choose one, I would definitely it definitely be that standing in the shower. Okay. But the, yeah, that's go ahead. Go ahead. The, the worst song on this album is that song. But okay, yeah, trim- I think Ted in summertime are close runner-ups to just vomit. Okay, I'll let you trim Summertime as well. <laughs> uh, Dave, what song would you trim off this album if you could trim one? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd go with either that intro, Up the Beach, or, you know, Thank You Boys, even though I like it. It, it just yeah. doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really go on the album, like I said. Right. But Actually, you know what? Easy cuts. I think it was Dave, you said earlier, where, uh, you know, like, you take the, the first song and put it as a first side, first cut on the second side. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you boys would be perfect for that. Like yeah. you flip it over and it's kind of like that elevator music where you're like, wait up, what am I waiting for? And right. then just come in and punch you in the face. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. I, dude, yeah. I can totally see that. And I wish that they had used it in that way instead of just having it be a standalone track. Cause it just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, I agree. A terrible placement. Yeah. Okay, if you had to replace one member of the band, and you can choose any musician from time, and I want you to also give me the genre that it would be for this musician, uh, who would get the gig? Um, Dave, go ahead. Who would you cut and who would you replace him with? Oh, boy. Um, I I would have to take out Perry. I mean, he's just just too weird for me. (laughs) Um, But but my replacement choice would be King Diamond. Oh shit! Wow! He's wow! Like, he he's got that vocal range. He you know does. he could match that, and and then some. You know, but uh, you know, might might give a little more, uh, you know, a little evil tinge to the things that are going on. But yeah, it would be pretty sweet. Fucking King Diamond, Dave. <laughs> yeah. Rep- 
That's good. That's good. Ed, who would you replace and who would you replace him with? Uh, I'd have to go with Farrell as well. Um, oh, you guys. <laughs> you know, I get it. He, he's kind of, you know, he's the nut and butter for this. Yeah. Uh, the problem is replacing him. This is going to be so bizarre, oh, but God. I think Stevie Wonder would be fantastic. <laughs> okay, okay. Step into my office. You're fucking fired. Okay. <laughs> I do. I think just, I, I think, I the I hear these little tones in, in, in bits of music on this that I'm like, oh my God, if they kind of elaborated on this little section, this four beat area, you know, this... This little just run, I just I don't know. I I think the funkiness of that I really enjoyed in Idiot's Rule just makes me think if they did more of an album like that and had more of a funk vibe to it, you know, throw Rick James in there, you know. Rick James, you know what? I'll go with Rick James before I go with Stevie Wonder. Yeah, but Rick James is probably a better fit. Yeah. Yeah, but that but what you're saying is like possibly like an African American singer with some like um some soul and a little bit of like you know. You know, just a little, a little, a little spunk. I think it's someone who can naturally create what Perry Farrell's trying to artificially create. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can see it. Absolutely. Cause you know, like you said, this, this album has a lot of undertones to it that, um, you know, maybe don't connect it totally with a, uh, alternative rock album. So I could see that. Um, <clears throat> so mine's weird too. I would replace Dave Navarro for a, uh, rebel yell era, Steve Stevens, because Steve knows his way around the whammy bar. He loves to throw a bunch of effect on his guitar. And he also is a very talented lead guitar player. He can play a lot of different styles. So, and, and he also, I think, you know, you could take him out of that Rebel Yell video with that fucking haircut and that leather jacket and pop him right into fucking Jane's Addiction and, and it's going to work. Nice. Um, yeah, it, it would work. Yep. All right. So final thoughts. Um, I thought this album was exceptional. Perry Farrell delivers, you know, a haunting, powerful vocal performance. Um, backed up by, you know, amazing lyrics written from life experience. Eric Avery delivers unforgettable bass lines. Steve Perkins delivers unorthodox drumming that set this album apart from other albums of the day. Um, and Dave Navarro, you know, he delivers a very original guitar um, performance, a little over affected. And, you know, it's a jam, but it's easy to listen to. It's memorable. And uh, I just, I love this album. I think it's fucking great. And if not for the three tracks that I forementioned, this could have been a perfect album for me, but unfortunately it wasn't. Um, you know, doing the podcast made me really break it down and it wasn't quite as good as I remembered it. Um, so let me give you my Watt score. I think this album is pushing out 85 Watts uh so ed write that down 85 watts i got it okay and dave what are your final thoughts and your watt score on jane's addiction nothing shocking all right well i i think dave navarro is actually a very underrated guitar player he doesn't really get you know the credit that he deserves he's he, not in sort of the same uh conversation with a lot of other guys um you know who who you know, he's got a similar or even greater skill then. Um, but, you know, he doesn't really seem to care about that kind of vibe or, or, you know, standing up with guys who can play, you know, a million notes a minute or anything like that. Um, you know, so that's all right. Um, I, you know, just couldn't really connect with this album. Um, you know, just, just coming from that sort of, you know, pop metal, you know, background and it just, I, I almost feel like I was, you know, what, maybe 15 when it came out. And, and you know, I feel like I was already too old to, to sort of get the album, you know, when, you know, I wasn't like the target demo. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it's just, it, it was all right. I mean, a, a lot of my friends love it. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with a, with a 37. Oh, oh, oh. Stop. In a row. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh shit. In a row. 37 in times. Thir she sucked 37 dicks in a row. <laughs> Why couldn't you just fuck them like everyone else? <laughs> ah, all right. I love you guys. That's fucking awesome. Oh, great and movie. Great movie. 
<laughs> oh god ed what are your final thoughts on the album and what is your watt score uh so i agree with dave uh i just couldn't really connect to the album there are definitely i definitely found some tunes that i like that i didn't think i'd like um that you clearly don't like <laughs> <laughs> but um uh, and i totally put them on like a shuffle playlist um but other than really the, you know, Eric Avery and Steve Perkins killing it on this album, it, it just was average for me. It was just so blah. However, due to the time period that it came out, I'm going to give it better than I should with my watch score. And I'll probably give it a 45. A 45. Dude, I might have to go back and push this to 100 just to give it the score it deserves. I'm joking. I won't do that. Um, so, uh, so. Uh, it just, uh, I, Perry Farrell, just the whole tone of his voice, the entire album. Just it's a lot. I wanted to run headfirst into a brick wall. It's a lot. It's, it's hard you to pick. Please, will you please calculate the score and tell us how many watts this album is pushing total? 55.6. Six yeah, watts. I love it. That's what I love about you. Right to the nail. So 55.6 watts? 55.66. Oh, ooh. In okay. fact, if you want to get even fancier, it's a six, 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 oh, six, six, watts. Sign of the devil. Okay. So All this right. album is pushing 55.666 watts. Um, and Dave. <laughs> this is a dumb question since it's our first podcast, but where does that score land? Nothing shocking on the breaking vinyl charts. Well, since it's the only one on our charts so far, it is number one. Number one. I have picked a number one hit and we'll see how long Woo! this album can hold the number one spot on the, the breaking vinyl charts. Um, Dave. So as you do, in fact, have the next album pick, I know nice. I have been waiting patiently to find out what it's going to be. Will you please tell us and the listeners what album we will be discussing next time? And I will be giving a 36. Go ahead. All right. My pick. <laughs> 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 <Nerve ball. laughs> All right. My, my pick. And you may not be able to give this a 36. Uh, <laughs> Motley Crue's best album. 1983 classic shout at the devil okay so that's a hundred watt album uh, <laughs> i don't even have to fucking listen to it okay right yeah that's a fucking badass pick man i love it a great pick great pick and uh okay so um ed will you yes. please tell the listeners where they can find the show on social media we are on Facebook, Instagram as a uh, breaking vinyl podcast. Just search it. You'll see our wonderful emblem of a record with breaking vinyl in the parental advisory. Uh, I don't know. We all set with Twitter, Dave. Uh, Twitter is still being updated, but it will okay. be short. Right. Okay. And we've got a Facebook group at, um, Breaking vinyl. Facebook page, go, not a group. Fa yeah, Facebook page, exactly. Uh, breaking vinyl. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So, I would like to thank you, the listeners, for stopping by. And of course, I'd like to thank my two co hosts for helping me rip this album down. <laughs> 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 and until to make you next feel time. Depressed. Dude, I love it. I'm glad you guys brought it true. You know, <laughs> I didn't want you guys to fucking sugarcoat it because I'm not going to when I hate your albums. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> So until next time, take those records out of the sleeve and let the music breathe. See you later. <laughs>